Hi, Hi Sai. Good to see you. Here we are again on a Tuesday, and it's already wow. We're almost through August, and this is Yuntaku Live, episode forty-six. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're giving DJ and Lena break as they are very, very busy preparing for our virtual Okinawa festival. Mm-hmm. But of course, we have with us and still with us <laughs> all the way from San Jose and Stanford University. I mean, she's here, but uh, <laughs> originally from and raised in San Jose, Shizu. Hello. Yeah, if you saw me all the way at Irenohi, you might notice that I'm a couple shades darker. A lot of the uncles here have been telling me. Um, but yeah, excited to be here again. But you've learned a lot while you're here, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think we really enjoyed having you help us with is, of course, uh, our virtual programming. Mm-hmm. And and that's linked to, of course, we put it on various platforms. And you're probably better at explaining that than I am. So I'm going to let you do that. Yeah, so you can find out a lot of information, uh, whether through Facebook. There's, um, But our main kind of broadcast is through YouTube. So make sure to like and subscribe. If you're already watching Yuntaku Live, might as well just press the button, um, especially because we have Okinawa Festival coming up so soon, Labor Day weekend. Um, so yeah, make sure to tune in to our YouTube. <laughs> Aloha! Please kokua and help us reach new viewers by subscribing to our HUOA YouTube page. Look for the red subscribe button on the bottom right. It's free. Your subscription supports our mission to share Uchinanchu Aloha around the world. Also, don't forget to give our videos a thumbs up. Mahalo and yuta surugutu urige sabina. And that voice you heard was our very own Okinawa Festival Chair, David Jones. So, good job, David. And, uh, you know, we also have our Purple Blast. I hope uh, that keeps you folks in the loop because it comes out at any time. And, uh, you know, its purpose is to really keep you folks up to date, everything going on. And, of course, the other thing that's going to keep you up to date as to what's going on is our very own Pat Miyashiro. President Pat, he's going to come aboard and join us to let you know where we are in terms of uh, some of our events that we were trying to plan, but you know, COVID's hitting us hard and mm-hmm. we've had to, again, pivot to different ideas, different activities, and even cancel some. So let's bring Pat on. Hey, hi, hey, everybody. Am I on, John? I guess I am. Thank you, Shizu. Thank you, John, for allowing me to come on this program. It's it's it's, an, it's, it's quite an honor to be on, and um, I, I must say, um, I I want I want to I want to express mahalo and ipenihe to all of you. We're doing a wonderful job on Yuntaku Live. So so tonight I have basically three things that I want to relate to the to the audience, and. Uh, Basically, it's, you know, we had a meeting last week, Wednesday, and what we did was we had to cancel our Andagi, Underdog drive through event because of the rising number of cases of so COVID, COVID variant. Um, am I coming in okay? Am I all right? Can you hear? I guess so. Okay. Continuing on. Uh, <clears throat> Because, because of the government restrictions on gathering in groups, which prohibits us from mixing and cooking undergi on the dog, we are canceling our undergi on the dog drive through event. So the current refunds are currently being processed for those of you that have ordered undergi and on the dog. Okay. What is happening is our bento sales and pickup schedule for the uh, virtual schedule prior to our Okinawan festival program on Saturday and Sunday. September 4 and 5th, and the pickup times are from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, and 12 to 1. Those of you that have bought Bento, you made your pickup time, so it'll be at the Okinawan Center. What's most important is that our virtual Okinawan Festival program, which will be scheduled for Saturday and Sunday, September 4 and 5th, September 4 and 5th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook. So that is continuing on. 
that is most important that we still have a program going. Um, what's, what's more important is that for the first time on Saturday evening from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., KHON2 TV will be featuring an Okinawan special. And I encourage all of you to watch it because it'll be the first time that they have it on. And I think it's, it's, it'll be something special that you don't have to go on YouTube. You can just watch it on KHON2 Channel 2 from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, <clears throat> then our virtual Okinawan Bond Dance, which most, which most of you really like, will be on from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. again on YouTube and Facebook on that Saturday evening. Sunday, we'll have the same program, 2 to 5, on the Virtual Okinawan Festival, and a repeat of the uh, KHON2 Okinawan special. So I recommend all of you to watch that. On Sunday, it'll start from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. So basically, that's all the news I have for, 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 for the weekend special. Uh, COVID really has turned, turned us, had to make us pivot, like, like John said. Uh, so, so we're trying to keep the safety and health of our volunteers in, in, uh, in, as an important guidelines to our, to our actions. So again, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the time that you've given me to speak to all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Bye bye. And as Pat mentioned, you know, it's going to be an exciting week before the Okinawan Festival because, as he mentioned, there will be a lot of programming on KHON and a lot of other television channels throughout the day. So uh, stay tuned and just come along for the ride. It's going to be fun times as we head into our virtual Okinawa Festival. But for tonight, we have yet another exciting guest. Uh, this is someone that I met back, way back in 2008. He joined me uh, with his parents, uh, James and June, for the study tour. And 2008 was my year as uh, HOA president. So I was hosting the tour and he came along with his daughter, Rain, who was only seven years old at the time. And Jeff Higa, was at the time, I believe, the executive director for the Waipahu Cultural Village, uh, very near to us. And so I didn't even know at that time that he was an accomplished writer. And, you know, I wanted to just mention some of the awards that he's won in the past. He had the uh, McKinney Writing Award, and that's uh, from his university, connected with his university. Uh, that is, I, I have a hard time pronouncing this, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. And then he also placed first in the Business Today essay contest. And he had a travel grant from the University of Missouri. He had the Harper Collins Fellow in Composition. He took first place in the full-length play at Kumu Kahua. Uh, again, a Hawaii Prize full-length play. This is in 2003. And then he took honorable mention in the Kurt Vonnegut Fiction Prize. Uh, that's a very uh, prestigious prize uh, back in 2019. And also the Robert C. Jones Prize for Short Prose. So uh, that led to what we're going to talk about tonight, which is his new book called Calabash Story. So let's welcome in Jeff Higa. Hi, hey, Jeff. Hi. <laughs> A hey, long time no see. You know, I, it, yes. it took seeing your face pop up in not only the Star, Adverti uh, Star, Star Advertiser article and also a Hawaii Herald article written by <laughs> our mutual friend uh, Lee Tono Uchi, a pigeon mm -hmm. gorilla. Uh, I'm sure he's watching or will watch. So, uh, again, I was, I was just really surprised looking at your accomplishments as an author and i thought whoa this guy was on my tour i should have had you write the summary of the tour that summer <laughs> or that, that fall had i known no, but yeah no. nice to have you nice to have you you know uh, join us and uh it seemed like you you've led such a interesting life uh and so we wanted to bring you into the homes, into the living rooms of our viewers and, and get to know you more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, so um, let's maybe just start with very early years and where you were born. I understand you went to Mililani High School, but also moved around a lot because your dad was in the service. So just tracking that childhood a little. Uh, okay, yeah, he was uh, uh, in the Air Force, right, uh, you know, during the Vietnam era. And so, yeah, we, we grew up all over the place. As an Air Force officer, he had trainings, different places. So we were in Mississippi in the 70s, Alabama, um, you know, when there was a, a Jim Crow kind of stuff going on. Mm. Uh, we moved it throughout the Midwest. Um, in Illinois, uh, we're, my sister and I, who's three years younger, um, were the only Asian kids in the small little Illinois town we lived in. So that was uh, something different for all of us there. Uh, mm. You know, we were stationed in Korea as well. Uh, wow. Yeah. So kind of all over the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, I think earlier you were mentioning um, before you came on that you moved something like nine times um, in your childhood and I was just wondering where was the most impactful or where you liked the most growing up uh, well it you know it's it's I don't know if other people are like this but Hawaii people are like even if you move away for like mm -hmm. 20 25 years when you say home you mean Hawaii yeah you don't mean <laughs> where you lived the last 25 years, right? <laughs> so wherever we moved, um, it always just felt always temporary because, you know, Hawaii is always home, right? Yeah. Only get the kind of food here, only get pigeon here, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Mm. Um, what was the question again? I forget. No, <laughs> that, that, that answers it. Um, so then I'm curious, but for college, you went all the way to New York for uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. So was there something, was it the location or really the school that drew you over there? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I was at, yeah, so I was at Millennium High School and um, I don't know, like when I graduated, I wanted to get as far away as I could mm. from Hawaii, yeah. just try something different. So. Uh, I didn't get into MIT, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to Rensselaer <laughs> Polytechnic Institute instead, uh -huh. which was filled with people who didn't get into MIT. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so that was like upstate New York, so it was cold. Mm, right. You know, I'd never seen a hockey game before, mm. so that was interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, it was just very hard the first year yeah. mm. um, but I, I heard that one of the things you did enjoy about New York was having a bookstore in your building and I don't know if that's where kind of your interest in literature began um, but do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah yeah so I, I went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute it's an engineering school um, mm -hmm on a computer science ROTC scholarship. Mm. And uh, uh, after a while, I was like very not interested in computer stuff. I just found it really dull after a while, programming mm -hmm. all the yeah. time. And so um, I dropped out for a little while. Mm. And, uh, and I started washing dishes at this Japanese restaurant because uh, we could eat dinner afterwards for free. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I lived in this building downtown, and at the corner of my building was this um, uh, bookstore, a used bookstore. And the used bookstore had paperback books for 25 cents uh, outside all the time. And so I thought, you know, I'm not in school anymore, so maybe I should try and self-educate or something. Mm. So I just started pick up cheap books that I'd heard the titles of. So I started reading a lot. And then uh, at one point I was reading Catcher in the Rye, which we all read in high school, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah. I can write like this. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. when I went back to school, I went back to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I, uh, I went back to school and I took literature classes and writing classes and that's how it all sort of began. I found it much more fulfilling than computer science and technology. Mm. 
Yeah, I can relate as someone who did my undergrad in like neuroscience and computer science and now I'm doing a master's <laughs> in sociology. So similar um, sentiments. Um, and then my understanding yeah. is uh, after you kind of discovered that passion, you decided to go to University of Missouri and get your master's in creative writing. Right. Yeah. Well, what, what happened was I graduated and then uh, I decided I wanted to go to the MFA programs in fiction mm -hmm. writing. And mm -hmm. so I applied and I went to Arizona State. Mm -hmm. um, but I found it didn't really fit very well. I didn't fit in very well there with the program. So I went to a bunch of different programs. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife was getting her PhD at that time. And so I would just move with her to another school and I'd try it out around the, mm -hmm. the colleges there. And then I, I wrote, in the meantime, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm writing, what I should write about, you know, what do people want to read. And I wrote the Christmas stories, which is in this collection. And I submitted that at the University of Missouri. And the professor there called me up and said, you know, the other stuff you submitted, I just kind of ignored it. It's no good. But this story is pretty good. <laughs> and so he and I said, OK, you know, this guy understands, even though he's not from Hawaii, he kind of mm. understands what the story is about. So that's why mm. I stayed and finished up. I had a question. You know, I, I thought I also saw that at, at that time, I don't know if it was in Missouri or not, you were working with, with kids. Can you, oh, can you tell, yeah. us, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was in Arizona. Yeah, they had this special program where they would take writers from the university and they would send us down to um, the reservation, basically, to work with Native American kids who... Um, were interested in writing and so that was uh, we would go down twice a week I think and it, it seemed like um, and it was very interesting because when they were writing when we first got there they were writing about I, I asked them to write about heroes that they know or uh, you know or, or whatever and so I got a lot of papers back with the Greek heroes and which was I guess their reading mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And so I was like, how come you guys are re writing about Greek heroes? You, you know, you have such a rich culture. So the next time, um, me and the teacher decided to go break the rules. And we went to, we took the kids to uh, like, a, like an Indian ruin, like a, uh, like, a, like a national monument of like where the Indians used to live this particular tribe and we asked them to write there, right at that site. And then they started writing about their own culture and stuff. And so our whole thing, um, we were able to, you know, they were able to write about their culture and their concerns. And uh, some of them decided to go to college after that, which was the best part because a lot of them, you know, just, didn't think college was for them or they would just go straight into the military but i guess mm. they saw us and you know they were able to maybe see a place for themselves in the college so that was really fun oh that's a great story because i mean a lot of the uh you know native americans have probably rich oral histories and yeah. and that's part of their tradition like a lot of cultures you know and mm -hmm. to pass on that those stories much like what you're doing through your stories of talking about ancestors, family histories, traditions. So that must have been really rewarding to see that that evolution in their writing. Yeah, that was really that was a nice change. Yeah. You know, speaking about kids, you know, you uh, I mentioned earlier that you brought your daughter with you to Okinawa, who was only seven at the time, and uh, you know, that was, was that your first trip to Okinawa? Yeah, it was my first trip to Okinawa. I had been to Japan several times, but never to Okinawa. So, oh, there's rain. Yeah, there's rain. Um, not as I remember her as a seven year old, <laughs> yeah. you know, all grown up now. Yeah. That's her senior picture on the left. And that the other one is the, it's a COVID picture, of course, cause she's with the mask. Um, and uh yeah that was that was our 
that was her first time too. Mm. Yeah. And like you, she she wanted to go away all the way to the East Coast, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess she wanted to, uh, you know, get away from us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know there's people in the audience that uh, recognize your mom and dad, but why don't you go ahead and, uh, you know, introduce the family members in this photo. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so my dad, the Higas... Are on the left so it's my dad james uh james higa one of the james higas uh, <laughs> and then it's me and then my mom june higa and then the three in the middle is my uh, mother-in-law and sister-in-law and my niece so uh they're korean haoli hapa and then uh rain and then my wife marguerite uh who's a uh, um She's a professor of biology at UH. Oh, and she also sewed me this Okinawan shirt. Oh, so I could wow. Wear it yeah. So, yeah. Get your orders in. She's, I was, I was <laughs> just going to say that. She sewed it for you just for tonight. You, you, you forgot uh, your four-legged family member there. Oh, yeah. Okay. On the very bottom on the right side is uh, Tim Tam. No. So, like the cookie, he's... Um, from Australia, Sydney. So we, oh, we, we got okay. him. Yeah. Uh, he's a collie. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure you can introduce this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's just my PR picture <laughs> of me at the at the shop in Kaimuki uh, with my book, Calabash Stories. The, the uh, cover illustrator is local also. Um, his name is Edwin Ushiro. And uh, he's, was he from Maui or the Big Island or something? But anyway, yeah, I was lucky he, he agreed to put his painting on the cover. Yeah, that's a, that's a, actually that's a nice photo that connect, a uh, painting that connects to your stories. You know, you, you haven't been back to Okinawa since that trip in 2008. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, were there things that, uh, when you went to Okinawa that surprised you or, uh, you know, just things you, you probably had some expectations when you went there. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I expected, I guess I expected it more to be like Japan, really built up, really modern, really, you know, and, and one of the first things since I lived in Arizona and uh, I, I remember how Korea was before it got really built up was everybody's swamp coolers. Like you get off the, the plane, you go on the bus and people don't have air conditioning in Okinawa, right? A lot of people don't. And they have these swamp coolers. And I thought, wow, this is like not like Japan, you know? <laughs> and so um, so that in that way, it was kind of nice because like not everything is totally crowded. Like the beaches mm -hmm. are like, you know, they're still clean and not so commercial, you know, mm -hmm. like the ones you took us out to. Mm -hmm. um, is like a lot of family kind of um, businesses, you know, and I and I thought the people, the Okinawan people were more generally interested in us as, you know, Okinawans from Hawaii than Japanese people in Japan are interested in us as Japanese Americans. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Japan, they just say, oh, you look like us, but you don't sound like us at all. Um, but in Okinawa, they're not like that at all. They they kind of want to know about you, you know, what what you're doing, and they just seem more interested, more open-hearted that way. So I was, I was, uh... and then, but my daughter has gone back, you know, for the exchange program several times. Oh, okay. So yeah, so she's lived with the families and saw that domestic part. Well, you know, of course, a big thing with Okinawa is they, you know, they put a lot of importance and priorities on, on family lineage and getting in touch with your ancestors. Uh, so mm. I think 
she too has some questions about that. Yeah, no, it's funny because I was, I've been FaceTiming my grandpa um, over in Okinawa because I've been wanting to see some family pictures, but it's over FaceTime, so he's like holding up a photo album, not in frame. Um, <laughs> but you have these wonderful pictures of your great-grandparents and grandparents, and um, I was hoping you could kind of talk about them and talk about these pictures because they're so oh, stunning. Yeah. yeah, they're they're kind of amazing. Um, this one was hanging in my... Um, Great grandmother's house for a long, long time, and this is um, this would be my mar fraternal. So my grandfather's family in mm -hmm. Okinawa, and so like the the baba in the with the white kimono, she still has mm -hmm. uh, the tattoos. What are those called? Oh, Hajuchi? the hajuchi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So in that picture, you can see her hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I still have that. So yeah. And we don't know too much about the people in this picture, you know. That's mm. that's kind of one of the things my dad's sort of working on with the genealogists. But um, yeah, his father's side, we don't really know too much. Mm. So yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, the second picture. Well, my grandfather, he was born on the Eva plantation. Mm. And, uh, but when he was young, he injured his leg. And so one leg was always shorter than the other by quite a bit. Um, he told us, he told us that he injured it playing baseball. Um, mm. uh, but I remember, and my dad doesn't remember this, but I remember one time I said, you know, so you heard it playing baseball. And he said, no, that's not true. <laughs> and then I said, what happened then? And then he wouldn't say anything after that. Oh. So, <laughs> so we just accept as a family that he heard it playing baseball. And so, okay. <laughs> although, you know, he didn't want to admit it. But he owned a restaurant called um, Palama Inn. You know, uh, one of those Okinawan owned inns. And so he was a yeah. cook. Mm -hmm. wow. Since he couldn't work on the plantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, was oh, he this mostly cooking? Oh, no, yeah, I was just going to ask, was cooking Okinawan food? or? Um... Yeah, Okinawan Japanese food in mm -hmm. Palama. Um, mm. And then when the neighborhood became more Filipino, he mm. made, started making Filipino food. So he made a really mean mm. adobo, man. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of Filipino foods that are can be found in the Okinawan uh, cultural dishes as well. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah, he was, he was pretty flexible that way. Oh, oh let's this go is back one photo. I, I don't know if you got a chance to. Um, oh, yeah, this is my, um, this is my great grandmother. She's the baby wow. in the picture. Wow. wow. Oh, no, no, wait. No, wait. Sorry. No, that's my, that's my grandmother, the baby. So my great-grandmother oh, okay. was, hold, was holding her. Yeah. Um, and this picture is kind of uh, destroyed by age, but you can still see her magnificent hairdo. Yeah. Picture, yeah. Yep. yeah. It's like Elvis hair. <laughs> yeah. It's really impressive. So, yeah, that's, that's Kama, my uh, great-grandmother. Holding her. And then, oh, this would be, um, so in the middle standing is my great-grandfather. He had six children, but three of them died in infancy. Um, you know, I guess pretty common in those days. So that's the, on the left, my uncle Takeshi. On the right is my uh, grandmother Fumiko. And then mm -hmm. sitting in front is uh, uncle. We don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get the name, or maybe we don't know for sure. But that's uncle. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Where? What areas in, in Okinawa were you? Were you? Oh yeah. So, so my, my, my uh, father's father came from uh, Cuba, Aza Cuba, uh, and then the mother, his mother's side came from um, Tomari. Uh, 
Nanka Goose Goose on. So, yeah, but they, the, the strange part was she went back to Okinawa when her, uh, what was it? When her grandmother was sick, her mother took her back to Okinawa. And my grandfather, who he, she would eventually marry, went back, happened to go back at the same time. So they spent, they knew each other from elementary school. They knew of each other. They never really met. And then years later, they would get married on Oahu when they were both happened to be on Oahu too. So, Wait, they didn't meet each other again until they were both here in Honolulu? Yeah. Or on Oahu? Yeah. Wow. Whoa. Yeah, so it's kind of, so she, she remembered him from elementary school, but, you know, they weren't friends or anything. So, yeah, strange, yeah. But I guess that was common. They went back and forth, yeah, for, before mm -hmm. the war. Yeah. So. Oh, and, and this is my parents' wedding picture. So uh, on the left is um, it's me, my maternal grandmother and my mother, of course, the bride. Um, and so they're Naichi. <laughs> mm. uh, so I'm actually only half. Uh, but, and all the Higas are on the other side. So my dad, his parents, and his grandparents, Shuichi and Kama, are the grandparents. We were we were chuckling just to explain to the audience. We were chuckling a little earlier because uh, you know Jeff's dad, James, who a lot of us are very familiar with, uh, shares the same name with. Shizu's dad, yes. James Higa, <laughs> you know, and Shizu is one who never met a Higa before coming to Hawaii this summer. <clears throat> her her email address at Stanford was Higa at, e, you know, Stanford EDU or something. I thought, oh my how do you gosh. get away with that? Yeah. You know, if you were at the University of Hawaii, it'd be like Higa29 <laughs> at, you know, uh.edu or something. But yeah. uh, oh, so... God. I told her you meet a lot of Higas, you know, when you come come here, and then uh, and now she she knows someone whose dad has the same name. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. we're distantly related somehow. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool. I have a I have an uncle who's a writer. I've never had had that before. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad still gets mail for the other James Higas sometimes. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, how funny. Okay, well, um, I I know that w you have a play called Footless that won the uh, Hawaii Prize from the Kumukahua Theater. Um, and as someone who doesn't know Pigeon or is not a local, um, could you describe to me what Footless is? Yes, we means? all know that you're not local <laughs> when you say Footless. But we'll let, we'll let, we'll let Jeff explain Oh, yes, that yes, please. <laughs> okay, so Footless. Footless, okay. Footless. So you know what fut means? No. <laughs> oh. Well, fut is, uh, how did you describe it, John, when you were talking about testing the mic? Well, oh. you know, I was trying to be educated and I said flatulence, but, you know, flatulence, I think otherwise yes. known as a fart. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so to be futless is to be uh, kind of, um, how do I say this? To to. To, to be kind of like at ends where nothing seems to work and nothing is coming together right and you're just kind mm -hmm. of loose that way. And so the play is about two, is it two local guys? Mainly two local guys who are trying to generate something and, it, and it's, it's a comedy so things fall apart and they don't quite come together and they start mm -hmm. getting chased by the cops and the cops get distracted. So... Um, yeah. You know, actually, that you, now that you bring it up, I'm not sure how fut and futless go together because yeah. the meanings don't really jive, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. We, we've grown up with those two words, uh, you know, all, all our lives. But it's like, wait, gas <laughs> and being footless doesn't exactly go together. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wish we we had a clip of um, the play, but uh, I know that you're going to do some live readings for us today from Calabash Stories. Um, oh, yeah. So 
Do you want to kind of introduce the first reading? I understand is the Christmas stories, which is the story that the University of Missouri professor noticed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. so this story um, grew out of, like I was saying, I was in St. Louis, and uh, you know, when, when, okay, so you get Christmas, you have a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. And then when Christmas is piled, you just throw it away, yeah? You throw it on the curb. Yeah. So I never really noticed that. But in St. Louis, one Christmas, they had a white Christmas, so it was snow. And then afterwards, everybody threw out their tree. And so there was all these trees just sitting on the curb with all the white snow. And I never noticed that before. And I thought, you know, what, what would my grandfather say about all these trees that are just being thrown away? And I thought he would say, wow, wasting a tree. So that kind of, that character I guess or that idea kind of generated this story and it it brings from my past too because um, you know the the main character's father is a, a yard boy what they call the yard boy and so what are they call gardeners now you know one of those traditional Japanese mm -hmm. um, yard man gardeners yeah and so you know they're mostly well, there's a lot of Filipinos now but back then there was a lot of Japanese in the early days so um, I use that too in this story. <clears throat> so it's called Christmas Stories. My father spoke of the Hakalau sugar plantation like he spoke of death. Something immutable that taunted him at every risky venture, greeted him at the end of every failure and loomed like a buzzard over him, waiting for him to stumble so that he could pick his bones. Having grown up in the Japanese section of the plantation camps, I was used to this kind of traditional morbidity, but my father's fatalism was different. He embellished his specters, animating them and seizing my imagination so securely that I continued to dream of death not as a rattling skeleton, but as a hided cane worker sweating flesh and dirt, his square hammer-toed feet leaving bloody tracks on the porches and floors of my nightmares. We thought of the plantation as part of our family, a wicked stepfather perhaps, some place we could always go back to, but without our self-respect. So in January of 1923, when we left the plantation for the third time, we have no way of knowing for sure that it would be for good. My parents moved into the plantation, uh, excuse me, my parents moved into the Palama area of Oahu, an area filled with Filipino and Japanese plantation expatriates, people like ourselves who possess the immigrant's vision like a blinded horse of only looking forward. My father used to say that he didn't have time to look where we were, only where we were going. It would be many years before I realized that this was because where we came from was too deeply in inscribed upon his memory. But for me, away from the plantation, a whole world had opened up. Luxuries that I had only heard about and never believed, such as children's shoes, suddenly entered my life and all things seemed possible. As his own boss, my father worked harder than ever, keeping the hours of his cane working days, sunrise till sunset, six days a week. He worked as a yard boy, cut the grass, trimmed the hedges, tended the flowers. They're called gardeners now, but yard boy is what the Howleys called it, and to call it anything else would have been useless. He prided himself on being quiet and efficient, keeping immaculate flower beds, and rarely chatting with the other domestic staff. I imagine the wealthy families in Manoa that he worked for thought well of him, a credit to his race, passing his name along to their friends, speaking of his reliability and industry. What they never discovered were his little acts of defiance, our eggplant vines growing amidst their hibiscus groves, the rose gardens he would die and blame on the insects and later replace with tropical plants. The ponds he created upon request, never warning them about the mosquito breeding. As the oldest son, I helped him in November and December so that he could charge a little bit more and try to pay off all of our debts before the new year. I helped him for years, happily abandoning my schooling during those two months eager in the promise for more firsts, our first radio, our first icebox, our first automobile, our first house, which was the real measuring stick of our lives. My father's plans, however, were different, as he secretly squirreled away most of the money in the bank, waiting for that day when he could purchase a, 
purchase us an entirely new life overnight, that first foothold in the American dream. So that December of 23, we were working the grounds of the Van Harding estate in Upper Manoa. It was the biggest place he worked for, and he usually spent his Saturdays there, preparing the grounds for some kind of gala event, the welcoming of a new industrial pioneer to the islands, or the hosting of a private charity. I liked to work with him on Saturdays. It meant missing Japanese school. But mostly I enjoyed the bus ride from the fevered alleyways of our dusty community up into the cooler reaches of the mountains and into their shaded valleys of breadfruit and banyan trees. Once there, I was never very much help. Just followed him around with the rake or the rubbish bag, picked up fallen palm fronds, or watered the hibiscus. But I liked to go with him because sometimes I got near enough to the Van Harding house to catch a glimpse of the inside. My mother used to call it the Ichiban White House because although the other Howley families had white houses, the Van Harding house was the biggest, the whitest, and the cleanest. My father, however, had another name for it, the Obake house. Ghost house, too white, you would say. No more anybody there during the day, just like one ghost house. Shaking his head, he would go on, Why anybody want a white house in the first place? So unnatural like that. Hard to take care every time, chip, gotta repaint. He would conclude by spreading his arms and saying, More better have one house like this. If a little bit chip, a little bit dirty, no matter. Brown paint anyway. Every time he said that, I would look upon our house and think how poor it looked next to the Van Hardings. Like newsprint next to linen and I would hunger even more for what I thought cleanliness and whiteness could buy, prosperity and satisfaction. So, uh, you know, that, that idea of the two different cultures kind of goes on through the story. I, I love that story. You know, I, well, one, I have a brown house. <laughs> so... <laughs> You so don't easier? see nothing. Yeah, you don't <laughs> see nothing on a brown house. Uh, you know, I, I, I got, those of you out there, to, you know, he read an excerpt from his stories. But if you go to his website, I think it's Jeff at, what is your website? Um, Jeff, JeffHiga.com. Jeff, JeffHiga.com, okay. Yeah. Easy to remember. And uh, you, you have on there uh, the... Uh, it was broadcast on what is it, Aloha Shorts or uh, yeah, yeah, Aloha a radio Shorts. program. Yeah, and and it's great to listen. You get to hear the whole story uh, played out by a lot of the local actors. You know, uh, a lot of people that we were familiar with that do um, local plays, and so it gives you this whole different uh, feeling to to hear the story play out. You know, arguably in like real life because they're doing the voices and. Uh, that was that was really. Uh, could you explain that? Maybe you can describe that a little better. No, that that, that that's perfectly right. You know, I was lucky they picked it. Uh, they wanted to do a Christmas thing, and so uh, they used that story for over two weeks. Um, and then. Uh, oh, that's yeah, right. Because there's a part one and a part two. A part two, yeah. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a long story. So that. <laughs> So yeah, they had a bunch of talented actors. They were great, and uh, over two weeks, yeah, they broadcast it. Oh, uh, yeah, that was that was. I, I, I like that. You know, I've always liked short stories. You know, a lot of times, uh, one of one of your stories is called Shadow Artist, and you know, of course, yeah. when I saw that, I thought, ooh, I gotta check this out. Is he writing about ninja or something? <laughs> you know, some kind of <laughs> local local take on ninja. But you know, finding out about that story was, uh, you know, that he had a a very interesting past right and it was about um how people use silhouettes instead of pictures yeah. uh in, in right. the past i thought that was so interesting because you know the one things that i liked about church stories is especially and you want uh that that story in fact won you honorable mention in the kurt vonnegut uh speculative fiction prize right yeah uh, from the north north american review and you know kurt vonnegut i mean mm -hmm. That that guy, it, it's all in the titles, and there's always there's always a, a what is that a twist at the end, right? Um, <laughs> so I was like, oh, hey, here I'm thinking it was about ninjas, uh, but you know, you, 
Going back to your family, you mentioned uh, your your grandmother, uh, Umeko Grace uh, Matsuyoshi, right? Mm -hmm. uh, did did she play a part in any of your stories, or did she have a uh, yeah impact? Yeah. So my uh, my my mother's uh, father um, came to Hawaii. Um, well, he was one of the first uh, head of surgeries at what was Kuakini Hospital, which was, you know, the Japanese Imperial um, Hospital. Um, and she was a nurse there at Kuakini. And so, um, but he died when my mother was seven. Seven. And so she, she never remarried. She was basically a working single mom, you know, in the 50s when nobody did that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, but to me, she was always just grandma, you know, your typical, really nice, very supportive grandma. And the only thing my mother ever said about that was that, you know, the, the mother, the grandmother you see before you is very different from the person that raised me. <laughs> and so, you know, she had, I guess she had to be tough, you know, to raise two kids on her own. Um, and she sent them both to private school on her nurse's salary. So I guess, you know, and I included that picture of her in the nurse's uniform back when, because, you know, she has a cute little nurse's hat, which nobody wears <laughs> anymore. And, you know, she had the white uniform. Everybody wears scrubs now, but she had the white uniform and white stocking and white shoes. And so um, that idea of kind of like a tough mother character, um, always appealed to me kind of a you know an older local lady who doesn't take a lot of crap so <laughs> yeah. you know I, I use that i use her sometimes in those stories yeah well you, you have an interesting story right the icebox stay coming oh yeah. sounds yeah, like something from sound like something from Kauai. i stay you i, I went stay go your house and you went stay come my house <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, I, I know Shizu couldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She got to listen to Rap Uppinger's local argument. Oh, I know, yeah. 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 <laughs> come on, come on, stay, you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, tell a, us about this uh, ice box that's the coming. Okay, so the ice box stay coming is taken from, the title is taken from uh, Eugene O'Neill's play called The uh, Iceman, The Iceman Cometh. Um, and it's about some guys who are sitting in a bar waiting for this other dude to show up. But um, this is about before refrigerators, you know, everybody had an ice box. And, and this is like new technology arriving to Muliwai Lane, where my grandmother lived. And so, um, yeah, and it, and it let me write about, you know, she never learned to drive, so... We used to walk everywhere, Chinatown, stuff like that. So it, it let me add those details in of, you know, walking and seeing the stores and mentioning some of the older businesses that are no longer there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the older people always, I thought I was the only one who really remembered some of this stuff, but nope. I got people writing me <laughs> saying, ah, oh, yeah, this is actually, you <laughs> called it this, but it's actually called that and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that was fun. Okay, let's hear okay. some of that. Yeah, so I'll read a, just a little bit. <clears throat> the icebox stay coming. My grandmother did not believe in luck. She was more fatalistic than that. She believed in bachi, an especially virulent form of fate. She believed that most of the time you worked hard for nothing, no reward, because bachi happens. The only thing you could do was be more sly than one mongoose, be more akamai than bachi. So then the day after New Year's in 1932, the year my grandmother took care of me while my parents made the long sea voyage to J Japan to pay respects to my father's parents, my grandmother got her first electric icebox. Bachi, we knew, would not be far behind. The arrival of the electric icebox came as a complete surprise to us and also to the delivery men who found her lane too narrow to drive the truck into. In those days, Muliwai Lane was like a number of small working class neighborhoods in Honolulu, where the streets 
weren't as wide as they are now. Squeezed between the shady enclaves, riding in the, uh, rising in the Koalau Mountains in the heat of the Chinatown Plain, even Muliwai Lane's widest point, the circle at the dead end, could only accommodate three people abreast. Years later, when we grew up and wanted to drive, when streetcars and the city bus became not the godsend they were to our tutus and parents because otherwise got to walk, but an unfashionable annoyance, only then did we re relent and roll back our front yards so the city could survey and plot and pave a street while we cheated our lots to build garages. But before that, when our properties were more approximate, See over there by the hibiscus that I got as a cutting while I was working for the Foster Estate? Come big, yeah. Our yard probably ends somewhere over there, and the Wongs, most of that side over there is theirs because, well, what you gonna do? They always need more room for their growing family. Otherwise, Bombay, they gotta put their house sideways. And of course, that ditch over there that runs into Muliwai Stream is part of the widow Gonzalez's property because she needs it to drain the wash water for all the extra laundry she takes in. All of our front yards spilled together and we kids played in one big yard, our yard, along the length of the entire lane, beneath the dormers of our houses like watchful eyes. So of course the truck wouldn't fit and they wanted to unload the icebox right in the middle of Nuanu Avenue, where I'm sure they would have left it because even though they were supposed to deliver on Sundays, they said it was really a gimmick for the store owner. And carrying the icebox down the slight incline of our narrow lane was too much work for a Sunday morning. They were explaining how lucky we were to have it delivered this far and not forced to come down to the store and pick it up, seeing as it was all free anyway. And when Shane, my best friend from across the street who always called on me around mealtimes and ate so often with our family that he had his own chair at our table, suddenly interrupted with roller skates. He dashed off while the rest of us watched the delivery men wrestle the canvas cloak appliance off the bed of the truck and onto the ground in front of us. A shrouded mystery, almost as tall as a man. Shane returned with a pair of his steel skates and also a pair of mine that I thought were lost and barked at the delivery man to raise the legs of the icebox one at a time as he expertly slid a skate under each leg and adjusted the positioning of each with the skate key. Soon a little parade formed down our lane, led by my exuberant grandma, high-stepping like a drum major, followed by her new icebox now propped up on rattling roller skate feet beneath its four legs. Flanked on both sides by the relieved deliverymen who guided the icebox down our little hill, followed closely by our curious neighbors and their children who had come to witness this remarkable event. The delivery men negotiated the icebox down the lane past the Dukina house and the monstrous hibiscus plants that rampaged through their yard. The unfortunate victims of their eldest son's studies in botanical grafting at the university then took a ride at the mountain apple tree onto the path towards my grandma's front door where they raised the icebox up so that we could retrieve our skates. It was only then when the delivery man had mounted the wooden steps for the front door sharing the burden of the icebox between them, that we realized the icebox was too wide to go through the doorway. It wasn't as if Grandma's doorway was unusually narrow. It's just that no one had ever imagined a need for a doorway wider than the space it took for one person with groceries to pass through. It would only be years later after half of Muliwai Lane had been appropriated when the stream had been diverted and my grandmother's house raised to make way for a looming concrete condominium that threw shadows so large, people said that the area birds had stopped singing because they had been plunged into perpetual nightfall. That I wondered how she managed to get some of her other furniture into her house, like her double bed and the couch. I like to imagine Grandma arranging the furniture first and then having the walls of her house built around her, like a queen ant who settles into a new location. If so, it would help explain why, in 50 years of living in the house, Grandma never once replaced or moved any of the furniture. We all have grandmas like that. But kept everything arranged in its familiar place so that no matter how long we were away or how far we traveled from Hawaii, we would always be able to return to her and the intimate, comfortable surroundings of home. 
After some half-hearted attempts, mainly at Grandma's urging to turn the icebox sideways, even though it was square, and back two of the legs through the door while trying to angle the rest of the it in, the delivery man put down the icebox, stripped its canvas covering, and declared, The bug got too big, but... They left the icebox facing the street on the stoop immediately in front of the front door, rendering that door useless and forcing us to enter the house through the back door in the kitchen. A habit that continued long after the icebox no longer barred the front door, because by that time the warmth of the kitchen had been the invitation into our home, and the front door was an alien thing, so much so that to enter anyone's house through the front door made us feel as welcome as door-to-door -door salesmen or proselytizing religious fanatics. So uh, this story is also based on my grandmother's house. It had a very, she had two doors in front of her house. So if you go to the plantation village and see the Japanese duplex, that's what she used to live in. There was a one building plantation house with two doors and it housed two families. And so her house was like that. So she had stuff in front of the doors because, you know, it used to be the duplex. So. Oh yeah. yeah, and those of you out there that don't know where Muluai Lane is, uh, that that's kind of my old stomping grounds by Kwana Nakua. So if you drive up New Wanu, and you know where you know you pass the Seven Eleven and you're coming across mm -hmm. Kwana Nakua basketball courts, that lane is right on your left side going up New Wanu, and yep. so you know it's probably looks a lot different today than it did back in those days because like you mentioned there's that big condo uh near the near the stream on the other side of the stream uh or nuanu nuanu river so yeah wow i that's that's an interesting story just to hear about uh the house and the area as well <laughs> yeah I hope you have an audio book if you don't. Yeah, yeah it's really entertaining <laughs> to hear you read this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, now, so you were mentioning earlier that you grew up partly in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, kind of at a time when there was some, like, still some Jim Crow. Um, and I, you know, I was in Texas actually last summer and kind of experienced similar things where. I felt like I was the only Asian that I can really see and it was a really strange experience and for a young local boy I just wanted to ask like what that was like for you and your little sister. You know I I don't remember well there weren't a lot of people calling us names and stuff it was more like mm -hmm. they just ignored us um, mm -hmm. but I do remember the classrooms are very segregated like all the white kids sat near the door then there was like a row of like the brown kids. So it was me, some, uh, some Mexican kid and somebody else. And then next to us on our left were there two rows of the black kids. And I just remember, you know, when I was young that, you know, if, if the white kids got caught passing notes, they just got yelled at. But if the black kids were caught passing notes, they had to read the note out loud in class. And so it just felt like, you know, just, just the double standard, the humiliation was like, and it, mm -hmm. and I don't think even the teacher realized, you know, how differently she was treating the kids. But to us in the middle row, it was very clear, <laughs> you know, um. we weren't, you know. Um, what happens if the middle row passes notes? Oh, uh, we didn't pass notes. Nobody really talked to us. <laughs> it was only like three, three of us, you know. So, uh. so it was like, you know, the black kids sat together in the lunchroom. The white kids sat together, and then there's just the brown kids, like. Just trying to eat lunch real quick so we can go outside. So that's yeah. because you're already an author and you probably were writing such a long <laughs> note that you didn't finish it before <laughs> class ended. Yeah, none of the girls wanted to read my long notes. <laughs> um, um, and I think we have some pictures of that time. Yeah, Chico. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yeah, this is a picture. Oh, this is actually in Hawaii. But yeah, this this is my parents when they were uh, younger. And my sister is um, still in my mom's womb in that picture. So it is a family picture. <laughs> and if, she, if she's watching, you are included. So, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was us. You know, for the summers, uh, we would come back home and stay. And since wow. I write a lot about the 70s, uh -huh. you know, there's what could be more 70s, John, than uh, <laughs> checkers, checkers and Pogo, right? 
Oh yeah, hey. like terrible haircut. <laughs> but that's that's checkers and pogo clothes. You could buy at Sears, right? Yep. Oh, they wow. just had a checkers and pogo special on TV the other night. I I recorded it. <laughs> oh man, I missed it. But yeah, yeah. Since I, you know, that's one of the big cultural things. And the other thing I tend to write about, uh, you know, a lot of local literature. Uh, and essays and stuff is about World War II, obviously, because it's so important. Mm -hmm. And the war was right here, but um, that's a little bit too old for me. So I write more about the Vietnam War, which is what I remember seeing on TV and hearing about. And, you know, uh, just, just that whole militarization of Hawaii during that time. So this is just a picture of my dad um, when he was in the Vietnam era. I think on the left is his vietnam um, campaign medal and then on the right is the, the bronze star presentation but that's when he was really you know because uh, he graduated from college right around the time mm -hmm. they were still drafting people so mm -hmm. he decided mm -hmm. to take more control and, and and join the air force rather than get drafted into the infantry and stuff <clears throat> he ended up making a career of it mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I included this picture because um, I wrote a, a story called Relievers, which is about mm -hmm. a really bad baseball team. And this was the worst <laughs> baseball team I played on through all my years in the military. Uh, my dad is, is, a, is a, you know, assistant coach on the left. But the, guy, the real coach is the guy on the, uh, I'm sorry, on, he's on the right, but the real coach is on the left. And he was a real redneck. You know, so this is from Alabama. I mean, in the, the team picture, you can see his, like, tin of chewing tobacco uh, in his pocket. <laughs> and this, this team, um, so in this league, if you, if you won first place, the next mm -hmm. year you get a choice. You get first choice of all the players. And the team that won last place got whatever was left. And so well, if you were new, like we were, and we moved in, we got stuck on the team. Nobody knew who we were. We got stuck on the last place team. So over the years, the best team was always the best team, right? If yeah. you pick that yeah. way. Yeah. And the worst team is always the worst team. So. I was going to say, so. how does that system work? But they're all yeah. wearing the Alabama red. And I think, you know, when you when you first was talking about what were, what were they called? The uh, Duringer Pools. I thought, wait, yeah. was that a misspelling? Like it should have been, you know, something like the Durham Bulls or something. And, it's like, <laughs> and I saw the photo. I thought I had to chuckle. I was like, oh, Duringer Swimming Pools. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a swimming pool cleaner kind of guy. And so, yeah, that was his, his business. And so, but, you know, we... Me and my dad went on the team, and we raised the team up to second to last. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's hear about that yeah, then. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, what am I reading? Okay, so this is Relievers. And I've always wanted to write a story about a baseball team, so. Relievers. I was so tired of losing. So when they shipped Chun Ho's uncle off to Vietnam, I took it upon myself to find us a new coach for the summer to lead us out of the basement of the Honolulu Little League. All spring, I had been working on my slider and rising two-seam fastball, and my dream was to walk into ninth grade, preceded by a reputation as an aggressive inside hurler who was ready to bean a few backs and knees when the situation demanded. I didn't blame Coach Ho too much for our losing record, even though some of my teammates did. Although we didn't quite understand what a draft number meant, even on Muli Wai Lane in those days, all of us knew that the announcement of another death of a brother, father, or son was just an army green sedan away. So I held my tongue on game days when coach would have us close our eyes, turn our faces to the sun, and have us imagine it was our last day on earth, playing the last baseball game we would ever play. What position would you play on that day, he would ask. Sometimes this exercise was too intense for the younger kids, and I could hear them start to sniffle, but most of us would clamor to play the undeserved positions we only daydreamed about. Pitcher, catcher, first base, or shortstop. As a result, our team specialized in walks, since our pitchers could barely throw pitches that reached the plate, 
in stolen bases since our jittery catchers were afraid of the ball, and in errors since our shortstops were slow of foot and poor in judgment. But if we players were seeing that calamity before us, Coach Ho seemed to be watching another game entirely as he leaned back on the team bench with a broad smile on his face and a dreamy look in his eye. Most of our fathers were not on the lane that year. Some of them, like my dad, were already in Vietnam and others were working double shifts at the hospital or at the bases to support the troops. No one seemed to have time for baseball except for us kids. And that is why I knew I would have to find a woman to coach our team. How about our moms? Shortshit suggested. Although he was the smallest on our team, he was still our best shortstop. We could ask one of them. Dawkins snorted. What do they know about baseball? They never come out to the games. That wasn't really true, but we overlooked his sentiment because we all knew he hated his mom. She was young, so she wore tight bell bottoms with macrame belts and belly bearing t-shirts and made everyone call her Julie instead of Mrs. Dawkins. She was much younger than all the rest of our mothers. And while that was enough to make Dawkins hate her, for the rest of their team, we were all sort of half in love with her. No, we're looking for, we're not looking for baseball knowledge anyway. We have a, enough of that already here among us, said Fleabag, our catcher and team philosopher, as he pointed to some of us. What we lack is someone tough enough to make the hard decisions that will turn us into winners. We all nodded at his sage advice. Could any of our moms be considered tough? There were some, like my family, whose dads were not around and whose moms had to go it alone. But even then, these same moms would later look at us a certain way and suddenly crush us with their hugs while they murmured something about high school and just four years away from the draft. We all agreed that this latent sentimentality disqualified them from the tough category. Someone mentioned Shane's mom, and we all turned to look at him. His mom had gone from housewife to big boss when she took over the house painting business that Shane's dad had to abandon when he got arrested and convicted for trying to liberate several cases of liquor from the back of Uptown Supermarket in the middle of the night. But Shane just shook his head. She paints during the day and cries at night, he said. He looked at his shoes and kicked at the dust. I think that's all she can handle. His admission stilled us and we quietly looked away from each other. That's when I saw my grandmother stride out into the lane and jaywalk across the street, gliding along with an orthopedic cane in each hand, pumping like a dry land cross-country skier as she propelled herself into the breach that the rest of us called 7-Eleven. This is Grandma speaking. Huh? People think I use two canes because I have to. No, I use two canes for speed. You ever wonder why a dog can run faster than a human? Four legs better than two legs. That's why by the time the boy caught up with me, I was already in the 7-Eleven. Unfortunately, I couldn't see him because the overhead lights in that place had immediately blinded me. I tried to tell him to watch out, but the lights were too bright and he was too young to go blind. But all I heard coming out of his mouth was, Ah, ah, ah. Grandma, what are you doing? I heard him say behind me. I swung around at the sound of his voice and my right cane struck the door frame just over his head. It reverberated like that like it reverberated in that empty store like a gunshot. I can't see, I can't see. It's like looking into the face of God over here. What are you talking about? he said. I could feel him push my back trying to get me further into the store. So I spread my legs and locked my left cane. No way was I going further into that phosphorescent maw. In that brilliant glare, I could just make out the registers and notice that the teen clerk had already crouched down and was peering at us from behind the safety of his counter. At least get out of the doorway, he said. A second shot was fired as I banged the other side of the doorway with my cane while I was bringing it around. Couldn't he see that the lights were too bright? I tried to jab my cane toward the ceiling, but the newspaper rack was placed too close to the door. Somehow, I caught the corner of the newspaper rack, which sent it keeling over and vomiting its load of newspapers all over the floor like a drunk. I could hear the clerk talking to someone on the phone, either his boss or the cops, and before I could bang the doorway one more time and get another shot off, the boy grabbed me around the waist, pinned my arms to my sides, and wrestled me out of the store. 
All I could do was beat on his shins with my canes until he released me in the parking lot. Even then, I noticed he stood between me and the store entrance. Every week they find some new way to kill me and you do nothing, I said. They are not trying to kill you. Oh yeah? Why do the why the bright lights this week? They're trying to blind me. All the 7-Elevens are like that. That could be true. I hadn't considered that. There was only one conclusion. Then they're trying to kill all of us. Us, said the boy. Yes, us. All of us old people. So this story also came from my grandmother who um, the local mini mart was bought out by 7-Eleven and she hated the 7-Eleven. <laughs> she thought it was she thought it was too bright. Uh, she thought uh. the floors, the old mini mart was attached to this uh, gas station. So I always thought the floors were sticky, mm -hmm. but she thought the uh, 7-Eleven floors were too shiny and bright and too um, slippery. So she used to hate. Is, the is this the the 7-Eleven right on Kokini and New One? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that one. She hated that one. <laughs> all the, she would send me. She would walk all the way to Chanhoon Market to get milk, or she would send me there to the 7-Eleven, but she wouldn't go in. Well, that's right, Chanhoon, <laughs> Chanhoon Market, yep. yeah, down at the bottom of Nuuanu. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, their baseball story is great. You know, the, the perspective of moms, uh, you know, taking over the team, and because uh, I know, I know, um, my younger son had that experience, and they were great actually as as coaches, and then of course they like. Who ever picks white pants for baseball? You know, who has to watch them? <laughs> and, uh, but also timely, you know, we got the Honolulu boys playing, uh, you know, yeah, to get close right to now. the Little League World Series tomorrow, 1.30, yeah. I think, uh, playing against Michigan. But uh, you also have, you have a passion for trading cards as well. Oh, so, you know, um, I wrote a story about baseball cards. And uh, when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have, kids didn't have money and cell phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the kind of thing we do, you know, we would trade baseball cards. And back then, it didn't seem like they were worth that much money. Like now, you buy baseball cards, you put them in this plastic holder so they don't get bent off. You don't stuff. even take them out, huh? Yeah. yeah. But back then, you know, you would trade them around, you get them all bent up, and you would put them in your pocket and stuff. And so the story was about that kind of cultural thing and then also um, being a military kid about moving around and trying to make new friends everywhere and about one mm. one friend I had that followed us to two different moves so I knew him longer than two years you know I, mean, I knew him for maybe four or five years and then later I would see him again when I was going to college uh, for my master's degree I, he lived nearby and so I'd see him again so this was this was a, kind of the story of our time together yeah all right let, let's hear it okay so this is a story called uh what did i call it uh, trading heroes oh and this is also about mike lum who in the 70s you know he was uh he was the he was a local boy who made it to the pros basically and so i i had never thought about that when i was little i just didn't think Hawaii people did that kind of thing, you know. Thought you had to be from Texas or California or the Midwest, and so this was, uh, you know, kind of my as a hero for local people. Yeah, a story about him as well. Uh, trading heroes. The only baseball card I ever coveted was of a first baseman for the Atlanta Braves named Mike Lum. This was in 1976 the prime of my baseball card trading years when I was at the top of my game, both in experience and skills. I was a veteran trader from as far back as the second grade and had amassed an awesome collection that spanned three decades and almost as many shoeboxes. Although I was consulted a lot on other people's trades, what do you think about being offered a whitey forward in his declining years for a 73 Vita Blue and Rolly Fingers? Like an experienced criminal attorney, I was only approached in the most serious of trades. Someone wanting to trade up for my rookie mantle or my pre-war Williams, for example. I often used my reputation of fear and intimidation to negotiate my exchanges. 
at W.O. Gladden Elementary in Kansas City, the only person in the fifth grade who could barter as my equal was my friend Jimmy, who initiated me into the world of baseball card commerce. He was the middle brother from a family of three boys and the only one in a family of Sicilian descent whose hair was not dark brown, but firecracker red, a trait that had last surfaced from the genetic drift in a nearly forgotten ant from the old country. I always thought it was this red hair that accounted for the bravado in his personality that I admired. Outside of my peers, I was a quiet kid, but Jimmy was a ribber among kids, grown-ups, friends, and strangers. He could not let a situation pass without comment, and he often ventured into the good, bad, and inappropriate for a laugh. He was fearless about making fun of everyone to their faces, even his parents, an action in my family that would have been akin to condemning myself to death. He was one of my oldest friends, more by happenstance than by devotion. Since both of our fathers were officers in the Air Force and worked in the same unit, as a result, our families were sometimes stationed together at the same base, moving in tandem at the will of the Air Force. He joked that I had to remain his friend because my dad worked for his dad, and you got to suck up to the boss's son. But in reality, he was the only friend I had known longer than two years, the typical duration of my father's postings. Perhaps because Jimmy was my baseball card mentor, he was also my fiercest opponent. He was, had a completely dispassionate attitude about baseball cards. In his hands, the cards were mere commodities. The players just value indicators like the designs on a bill for the part that really interested him, the transaction. He was a consummate capitalist with a robber baron mentality that even grown-ups could recognize. Once, sitting in the back of my family's station wagon, we were trying to complete our fifth grade homework. We were discussing a problem that had stumped us for miles. One quarter plus one quarter plus one tenth. When from the driver's seat, my dad asked, if I gave you two quarters and one dime, how much money would you have? 60 cents, Jimmy said immediately. My dad raised in a generation that taught that sons could learn all they needed by silence rather than explication. Pause to let this lesson sink in. Six tenths, I said finally in amazement at my dad's creativity. That's our answer, Jimmy, six tenths. But I could tell Jimmy didn't get it. He was still looking at my dad, thinking about the 60 cents that might be coming to him. If I had one liability as a trader, it was a touch of sentimentality, a penchant that drove me at times to make irrational trades, like a 54 feller for Vince DiMaggio, just so I could complete the DiMaggio brothers trio, Vince, Dom, and Joe. Jimmy knew this about me and exploited my weakness to the fullest. Rather than deal with specific trades of such and such player for his Mike Lum, he instead dealt in options. Since it was obvious that he was the only one I knew who owned, what was his name again? Oh yeah, card number 208, Mike Lum, he'd be willing to trade said card number 208 for two, no, I better make it three cards of his choosing for my entire collection. Such was the brutality of his methods. I never told Jimmy directly that I wanted the card, but with the instincts of a used car salesman, he had surmised my desire from the feigned disinterest I tried to allow, tried to show the card every time I thumbed through his collection. If I didn't pause to look at it, he would wait until I was well past the card before he fished it out of the stack again, parading it in front of me. Wondering aloud why I wanted that card so much, and who wouldn't wonder? As a baseball card, it was nothing special. It wasn't an action shot from an actual game, like a 76 Johnny Bench just up from his crouch, mask off, rising from the dust after having made it play at the plate. The Mike Lung card was a stage figure card in the most generic of poses, standing in the field, not even at the plate, the bat resting on his shoulder with an indifferent grin aimed at the camera. It exuded none of the fierce competitiveness I associated with professional baseball. Even in Lum's best year of 1973 when he batted 294 with 82 RBIs and 16 home runs, that card in mint condition commands only 50 cents. Not exactly an investment grade instrument. And so, um, yeah, so that's basically the story of the, of the card and our friendship. 
mm. um, that summer. You know, growing up, I don't, I don't think that we really people traded baseball cards, but I do remember my <laughs> brother kind of trading. It was Pokemon cards and Yu-Gi-Oh uh, cards. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I don't know what younger kids trade or like negotiate through anymore. But yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah, yeah. My daughter too. It was um, Pokemon cards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Yeah, I remember those. Mm-hmm. No stats on those cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we have some final pictures, and uh, John was telling me that even he didn't grow up, you know, seeing this wax museum. Oh, um, yeah. And museum. with this, um, I was just wondering how much of your stories are kind of um, inspired by views of Hawaii that maybe don't exist anymore or just aren't as strong anymore and how much is more of kind of still the Hawaii that feels very relevant or, um, yeah, relevant's not the right word exactly, but mm. yeah. I get, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why, but I, I, I tend to gather these things that don't exist anymore. I mean, I guess part of it is growing up in Muliwai Lane and, and seeing that neighborhood change. And, mm -hmm. you know, now we don't kind of tend to know our neighbors that much. Yeah. But, you know, my grandmother's day, they kind of all knew each other. They all knew everybody's business. You know, they are always <laughs> borrowing stuff from each other. I mm. always had to bring things to a neighbor mm -hmm. or do things for the neighbor, even if they'd mm -hmm. never asked. And uh, we kind of, you know, if I were to go into my neighbor's yard now, I he'd probably call the cops, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. So that kind of feeling, and I don't know how I discovered the Hawaiian Wax Museum, but evidently it was in Waikiki. It was a it was a tourist draw, and uh, mm. before and so I started on eBay buying the postcards from it to see what was in it, oh. um, and it had the usual things like you know Kamehameha and the mm. history and stuff like that. But it also had kind of I thought weird stuff like uh, Duke Kahanamoku with his paddle. I'm, I'm not sure why he's standing in his white suit with a paddle. And also Don Ho. You know, I've always, I've always loved Don Ho um, because he's so 70s. I mean, his, his clothing, his white clothing with the flares and, and the way he sings, it's almost like he's trying to catch up to the music. And, um, you know, and they say he was drunk a lot and all that stuff. So, you know, he, he's, in the, he's in the wax museum, too. And... Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I just thought, you know, when they close this thing, what'd they do with all this stuff? You know, what, what would you do with it? And that's how the story kind of grew out. Oh, and this last picture is just Muli Wai Lane from what I remember, um, before, like John said, before all the, all the development took uh -huh. it over and it was, um, so, you know, I, my, from what I remember is different from what my mom remembers. And so... <laughs> Mm. Um, you know that so yeah so I tried to I guess detail it all out before it disappears so I'll probably send this around oh. to other people to kind of there was a foodle yeah so the the house at the end belonged to the caretaker and under his house where we were always afraid to go was the foodle so if you wow. lived in that neighborhood you could you could use it yeah. And you didn't have to pay a um, uh, uh, maintenance fee for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. So. so this this last wooing Elizabeth is that kind of about your neighborhood specifically, or? Yeah, it, it was about my neighborhood and 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 the wax museum and mm -hmm. the the other thing is about um, you know how in Japan when you're sitting on the the train it's not that full everybody can sit down and yeah when i was in japan those days i mean people had cell phones but they weren't the thing like mm -hmm. you, you, know, you never have to look up now they were just kind of more phony than computers so you would sit there and you'd see the other person across from you right and you just mm -hmm. kind of you know for the hour or 45 minutes you're on the train you just kind of look at each other the whole time <laughs> <clears throat> and so one day i was sitting on the train and this girl came in, you know, she was wearing her schoolgirl uniform. 
but mm -hmm. she had this eye, the kind of lazy eye or something, a wandering kind of eye would just look, look all over the place. And then I started thinking, you know, what if somebody found that attractive? You know? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that would be a very interesting person. And, you know, um, so that, that was another thing that kind of generated this story um, mm -hmm. from my life. But um, this is called Wooing Elizabeth. Ooh, I'm kind of short on time, so I'll make it short. Um, this is the longest story in the collection, and it might be my favorite. It's the funniest, I think. But When people asked my Aunt Elizabeth about Uncle Mike, she would tell them, Oh, he said HCC, hoping they would think he was teaching classes or something at Honolulu Community College. When in reality, anyone who knew anything about him would know she really meant the Halava Correctional Center. He was serving a four-year sentence in minimum security for fraud. Simple fraud, he would remind me every visit. For impersonating a Nakahoro, or Japanese traditional matchmaker, who had died ten years earlier on an outer island. Uncle Mike had been really good at handicapping grooms, brides, families, and occupations the way he used to handicap jockeys, horses, trainers, and track conditions. By transforming his extensive bookmaking knowledge with its probabilities and percentages and leveraging the reputation of the real Nakahoro, he had created a clientele and a growing reputation for himself on Oahu. Up until the day he was arrested, he would say he owed all of his success to Elizabeth the woman who had taught him bonds of true love. Aunt Elizabeth was my real aunt. Deeded by blood and my mother's only sister, whereas Uncle Mike had only married in. However, not unlike the sympathy engendered between wary neighbors when faced by a common enemy, I always felt close to the men who became our uncles by marriage to Elizabeth. I could not imagine marriage to Aunt Elizabeth, the most grown-up person I knew. She was pretty, pretty like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, as my mother liked to say, and the only woman in our family who wore high heels all of the time. Never once I had, seen her, had I seen her in the flats our mothers had retired to so long ago. She smoked like a movie star, elegantly and continuously through long black holders to avoid leaving smears of lipstick on the cigarette, a sight she found vulgar. And like many great personalities, she habitually spoke of herself in the third person, a tendency I discovered at age five when I brought her my favorite board game. She looked down at me, arched her perfectly plucked eyebrow into a talon, and said, No one has explained this to you, have they? I shook my head. Anna Elizabeth doesn't do this shit, she said. She doesn't play shoots and ladders. She paused to blow smoke in my face. Do you understand? I nodded. Aunt Elizabeth is no fun. Good boy, she said, patting my head like a puppy. Now run along and find that useless uncle of yours so he can get Aunt Elizabeth a drink. So Uncle Mike and I grew close, drawn by our completely opposite yet similarly intense feelings for Elizabeth. And it seemed natural when he recruited me to be his assistant. Business had really picked up at that point, with Uncle Mike attending anywhere from six to ten weddings a weekend. And when he looked out at me, he saw a branch office, an extension of his matrimonial services. At first, he tried to involve me in every aspect of the business, explaining the arcane ranking system he plugged into the elaborate equations he had for developing and producing lasting marriages at a 93% success rate the highest of anyone in the islands and far above that of his namesake. But after a few months, it became apparent to both of us that I was not worthy of the profession. Matchmaking is a matter of patient observation, he would say. Clearly, at 14, I was neither patient nor observant enough. The woman I judged too ugly, he would relabel as kind and point out my oversight. Her second toe was longer than her big toe, a sure sign of intelligence. The guys I okayed as husband material, he would just groan and point out they came straight to the interview from a hasty shower with hair still wet, an indication of a hidden family history of mental abnormalities, for wet hair equals soft head. You can't rush to judge, he told me. It's like picking a melon. 
By the end, I was involved only in the purely clerical aspects of the business, setting up the client meetings, routing photos to parents and prospectives, updating the roster of potentials, and keeping his calendar of appointments. Areas at which I excelled by keeping careful and comprehensive notes. Notes that turned out to be quite helpful to the state prosecutors. Still, after he was convicted, not by the clients, did you notice none of them testified for the prosecution? and sentence. Even the judge admitted that on balance I had probably produced more happiness in the world than pain. And publicly disavowed by Anne Elizabeth. Oh, that crack about men being unreliable income hurt worst of all. Uncle Mike continued to keep up a relationship with me, much to the dismay of my family. For the four years he was locked up as I moved from freshman to senior in high school, he sent me letters and packages regularly. They were a great embarrassment to my mother and her sister because they smelled like the ashtray from a hotel lobby and were stamped all over in red ink. Note, this correspondence has been sent by an inmate from the Lava Correctional Center. Mother would burn with shame and apologize to the mailman profusely every time he delivered a package from Uncle Mike. But I suspect the mailman looked forward to these deliveries as much as I did. He would always ask me about them the next day and I would show him the latest prison handicraft Uncle Mike had created. An American flag made from strips of pornographic magazines with cigarette filter stars. A portrait of Jesus made from cigarette ash and hair from the prison barber shop. Iridescent black earrings and matching necklace made from cockroach carapaces. And an evening bag made from the silver foil of used cigarette packs, which I was to give to the girl who had eyes. Well, eye for me. So yeah, this, this, this is my longest story. It's maybe... 30 types set pages of so it was very hard to publish but mm. I was happy when it was picked up well again congratulations for Calabash stories you know winning the Robert C. Jones short prose uh, again you know any any type of writing is uh, you know one a, a labor of love right and uh, yeah and then to, to be recognized for it. Of course, I, I'm sure Lee Tonouchi out there is going to be going, what? How come? They never give, give you one book signing at the Okinawa Center like I had for Okinawan Princess. So, you know, as soon as we get out of this oh, COVID, yeah. you know, pandemic tailspin, you know, if, um, you know, we'd be more uh, than happy to have a book signing oh, for Calabash you. Stories right here at the Okinawan Center. Um, oh, thank but you. But it was... It was great to have you on, you know, Thank um, you. I, I, I think uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, get a flavor of the book and I ordered mine. I uh, unfortunately I didn't get it before today. I did order mine. You might want to let <laughs> people know how they can get their copy because they can, they can also drive up to Kamaki, right? Let yeah. You, uh, so explain. Yeah. So at the shop in Kaimuki, which is, um, uh, below best press. Uh, they have signed copies there, or if you prefer uh, um, Amazon, you can get it on Amazon. But no, it's a little long. Yeah. Well, I, is, I want. Is the I place. ordered mine from Amazon because I, I want you to sign it saying, you know, to to the best Okinawan tour escort I ever had. <laughs> of course, you only went once, uh -oh, but you know. Yeah. And and then make sure I I make sure you spell my name right, uh, John with no H. <laughs> oh yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. No, spell but I, right again, you know. Subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was fun having you on. It was great seeing you again. You know, please yeah, tell uh, Professor you. Butler that I'll be also putting in an order for uh, an Okinawan shirt as well. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, you know, uh, as Shizu, any last words? I, I think it was fun having Jeff on today. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm just about finishing schooling and figuring out what I want to do with my life. And I just thought it was pretty early on, but you were just mentioning kind of jumping around from different things because it didn't feel right for you. Um, and mm -hmm. I really appreciated your ability to kind of let something go and try something else. And hopefully I can have some of that moving forward, too. Yeah, just... Follow what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
And to all of you out there, again, thanks for watching us on Yuntaku Live again. This is episode 46. Mm -hmm. We just enjoy doing this for all of you out there, especially as we are once again dealing with the challenges of the pandemic. But don't forget, as we sign off today, we're going to leave you with a trailer of our exciting virtual Okinawa Festival coming up again in two weeks, just two weeks. And so... uh, Thank you, mahalo, ipe nihe debiru to Jeff Higa, all our viewers out there, and we'll see you again real soon with our Okinawan Festival preview show.